Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Yes. You make me feel like I've been out of A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. UENradio.com Animal Magnetism Exploring animal care for creatures great and small Conservation and preservation in today's world Find out what a single voice can do To make a difference in the lives of animals Animal Magnetism with Carolyn Hennessy Starts right now on UBN Radio Good morning preservationists, conservationists Those of you trying to cultivate the preservationist heart Yes indeed, Carolyn Hennessy here You are listening to Animal Magnetism I'm here with my fabulous co-host Miss Andrea Compton. Good morning. Good morning. Listen, before we get started today, uh, we are dispensing with news and views because our guest today is uh, not only calling in from New Zealand, we're at 6 a.m., thanks bunches, (laughs) but um, she is so kind of, she's so extraordinary, it makes my head spin. And what she has done in her comparatively short life is uh, more than most most people do in five reincarnated lifetimes. But I want to start today's show by telling you about a fabulous fundraiser this coming Saturday, October 26th, in old downtown Pasadena. <laughs> raise the woof. I want to say raise the woof, <laughs> but I but it's raise the woof. Haunted House to Benefit Angels in Fur. Deborah Wilson is going to be emceeing this year, so there will be, as I say, laughs aplenty. Mm-hmm. Live auction uh, featuring some amazing trips, delicious vegan nibblies, and surprise celebrity guests. And there is a costume contest for two and four legged entrants. So for all the details, please go to www. Angels in Fur Dog Rescue. One word, angelsinfurdogrescue.com. And the link is also going to be up on our Animal Magnetism site. Okay, what a, what a coup. You know, it's interesting. I say we have only the heaviest hitters on this show. And it's true. Yes, it is. We are, um, we are so blessed to have the delightful Miss Erin Ivory. What an interesting name, especially considering what she does with her life. Erin Ivory. Erin, your education is so vast. Your experience is mind-boggling. Your publications and presentations are, are worthy of doctoral status, and I fully expect the next time we talk to you, and we will, because we're just not going to be able to cover everything today, but I fully expect to see a PhD behind your name. Um, <laughs> you have worked with the Franklin Zoo Charitable Trust in New Zealand, Bush Gardens you've worked with, Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay's Lowry Park Zoo, San Diego Zoo, Project Wildlife in San Diego, SeaWorld in San Diego, Walt Disney World, Epcot Living Seas in Orlando. Well, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How's your tea? I know you were brewing some tea when we first got online with you. Is uh, it all tea. nice and... Yep, nice and brewed and sitting next to me. Delicious. Okay, I want to touch on some of your career highlights before we before we really start questioning you. It's just amazing. You have an, you have a, you've had experience with a wide variety of animals, including my favorite word in the in the whole world, mega vertebrates. That's great. Mega vertebrate <laughs> word. Marine mammals, primates, hoofstock, small mammals, birds, fish, sharks, rays, turtles, reptiles, insects, and the ever popular frog. You have cared for 33 elephants, Asian and African, four bulls, 20 cows, and nine calves or juveniles ranging in age from newborn to 60 and the diverse health issues associated with those various stages of life. You have also participated, this is my favorite thing, and this is what I would love to do sometime in my life. You have participated in seven elephant births, including hand rearing a one month African elephant to the age of three months. You've aided in the transport of elephants and you are currently managing, something we're going to talk about a little later on, the transport of one African elephant from New Zealand to the United States. Uh, Just a little bit more about you. You have always wanted to work with animals, but after graduating from Western Michigan University, you did not begin with terrestrial animals. You spent a great deal of time in the water at Walt Disney World as an aquarist. Aquarist? Say, say Aquarist. Aquarist. Oh, I got it right the it first is. time. I'm so smart. From there, you went to SeaWorld and continued to train and be trained 
in positive reinforcement training. And that, of course, is one of the cornerstones of this show. So we do talk a great deal about positive reinforcement training on this show, but I always love hearing it described by an expert, and yes, Erin, you are an expert. So let's talk about, tell me what you consider to be the basics of PRT. Um, first and foremost, it's always about the animal, and when you want to start working with any animal, whether it be, um, you know, an elephant, a uh, turtle or a um, zebra you have to start with building a relationship they have to get to know you and you have to interact with them in a way that um, they feel safe so when you're working with them through positive reinforcement training what you basically are doing is uh, creating lots of little interactions with them that are all based on positive and so through all those positive interactions you build a trust-based relationship and that's the foundation for your training and as you move forward it's all based on helping the animal succeed um, when you're working with an animal if you're always encouraging them and showing them what you want then they start to understand and they don't get frustrated if they don't get it right away so um, positive reinforcement basically just to me means you focus on what the animal is doing correct and any incorrect or undesired behavior, or let's say the elephant's just not um, quite clicking with where you're trying to take it, um, then you keep it positive, you keep it light. And the great thing about positive reinforcement training, by ignoring the incorrect or undesired behavior, that all goes away and you get the positive and, and you get an animal that is eager for training sessions, looks forward to it, and you get an animal that um, enjoys and then they don't get frustrated. If they make right. a mistake or they, they're they wrong, um, sometimes a lot of trainers like to use the word no. And um, what that does is it just tells the animal that they were wrong and nothing nothing good comes right. after the word no, right. <laughs> ever. Right, you turn um, you turn the animal into, as, as Gray Stafford says, and, and I have now absconded with this uh, phrase, you turn the animal into a willing participant. Now, Absolutely. you talked, to you, the, men, the animals that you mentioned were exotics. Elephants, turtles, I consider a turtle to be an exotic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, oh, and zebras, a, but a you can... Turtle, 450 pounds is exotic. Sure, sure, <laughs> yes, yes. A 450-pound turtle is absolutely exotic. Um, couldn't fit it in my bathtub. Um, but also, positive reinforcement training is, is the here and now the optimal training for domesticated animals, for dogs, cats, you name it. And that's why I always refer to, you know, there are books out there, Gray Stafford, Zumility, get it. Mm -hmm. um, Thad Lassenax, uh, um, uh, Whale Done, get it, people, get it and start using it. Mm -hmm. Well, Fantastic. and the other thing, too, is a lot of people, You, it, it's interesting working in the animal field because when you're out and about so much, you you're, your head just cringes. Um, but people, just like with their children, do not like for you to come up and explain what they're doing wrong with their pets. So unfortunately, you just have to sit back and just watch helplessly as these people will call their animal to them that's running away, shouting and yelling at them. And then when the animal comes to them, they'll smack them on the bottom. Well, why on earth would their dog want to come back? I don't know, Aaron. Do you really it have to sit by? It never makes any sense to me. Do you really have to sit by, Aaron? Can't you just, oh, I don't know. <laughs> get a stick maybe and go over and talk to them <laughs> no that's wrong that's I've, wrong i've tried i've tried no. working with people that just don't seem to understand and it is even if initially they're open it's so interesting how quickly it, it is it's like what talking to people about their children they just don't want to hear it no oh, no they don't they don't and unfortunately you have to show people right right you have to be able yeah. to show them the world is not a better place for it so mm -hmm. So, Erin, no. you know, why is PRT a better training pl plan, not only for elephants, but for all animals? And following up with that, how important is it in both a zoo and the sanctuary environment? Yeah, because we talk about it in, in terms of personal training for domestic, you know, for domestics. That's what most of my listeners can kind of relate to. But zoos and sanctuaries, let's talk about it there. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important because your animals, you want to create a secure environment and you're working with animals that are very strong in a lot of cases they're very they're designed to be able to survive 
um, in a pretty harsh environment, right. most of them. So um, their reactions are are a little bit more um, self-preservation. They've got a, a very strong fight or flight mentality. So if you want to get anything done with your animals, you have to be able to work within their natural inclinations. So if you're working with, let's say, Impala, um, and you walk straight at them with your eyes forward staring at them, they're going to run away. Wow. Even though you're not physically doing anything, what you're doing is you're looking at them like a predator. Mm -hmm. So you have to be mindful of the animal that you're working with. So if you're walking in and you want Impala to be comfortable and relaxed around you, don't look at them. <laughs> Got it. I mean, Got it. it. Now like, I know. Now I know. It seems so simple sometimes, but um, but it's so important because if you spook the Impala, they could run into a fence and kill themselves, and that would be horrible. Wow. I mean, the guilt you would feel after that would just be just horrible. So it's always important with that you can keep the animals calm. You can do in zoos and sanctuaries, what we do is we uh, take – our care a step further. We're always monitoring their health. We'll do blood draws. We'll do foot care. We'll do anything health related. Um, and the great thing about positive reinforcement is you can make all of those health yeah. routine health exams easy and no big deal for the animal. It can become fun and positive and, and not something that's going to be scary and negative and upsetting to the animal. You can actually turn it around and make it something that they look forward to. Right. Um, and that's that's a big difference. So if the animal's looking forward to your interaction and you being able to take care of it and look at it, um, then you can take better care of the animal. And the great thing about positive reinforcement training versus all the other st uh, styles of training is that positive reinforcement training does not take the animal out of the animal. Right. They are right. still allowed to be what they are. So an elephant is still an elephant. They come over to you. It doesn't change what they are. You are not controlling them. You are not um, dominating them. Right. You are working with them towards the end of their health care. Exactly. And some of it's just fun behaviors, too, because they like to learn just like we do. So it's always important to keep in mind that when you're working in a positive reinforcement scenario, it's always about the animal, and it has to be that way. So the husbandry that's performed, for instance, at a zoo, every time the elephant raises its foot or lifts its tail or presents its ear for a blood draw, it gets a treat, it gets a stroke, it gets a pat, it gets a, some type of something positive, which, again, makes it want to participate. It's just genius. I mean, <laughs> really, I, there's, I, I, I still am amazed that this is not you know the a and the, well the, the a to a to z exactly exactly because it's just so genius and so much of the danger and the threat is taken away uh with regard to well, and, to keeper handling and not only that with the positive reinforcement training you know when an animal's sick they don't want food so it has to be based on your relationship so the stronger your relationship is and there are a lot of people out there that will do positive reinforcement and say you know building an individual strong relationship isn't good. In fact, um, I got into a discussion with, with a well-known animal trainer about this. And my thing is, at the end of the day, if your animal's sick and uncomfortable, you want them to still come to you. You want them to stand there for whatever medical procedure you need to do. And they're going to do it not because of the food, because they're not hungry. They're going to do it because you're asking them That's to. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because positive reinforcement isn't just food. It's, it's, it's love. It's love in a, it's, it's the pet, the pets, the strokes, the patting, the whatever. Yes. It's, it's, you it's know, the, the cooing, it's, it's, it's everything. Listen, you, in our discussion before the show, you mentioned that you can tell one person, I, a lay person can tell if the zoo facility you are at or the sanctuary you are you are at is not using positive reinforcement training how what are the clues how can you how can you tell um they don't do any training sessions in front of you oh. for one oh. um, <laughs> if if everything that you're seeing is all routine behavior where the animal's going through something that's known for a long time and and they're never showing you how they train new behaviors then all of that happens in the back. 
Um, wow. If they are carrying an incus, that is a really good so, mm, indicator to sure. look closer. Of course. Um, I mean, most, and I will say most, uh, places that have incuses are not just using them in the way that is being portrayed these days. Right. Mm. Um, and even those that have them that don't use them that way, still, it's still a threat. It's still there in the animal's mind. The animal knows what it means. So right. even if you don't use it in the traditional sense, the animal still knows what it means because it has a history with that device. If right. it didn't have a history with that device, you wouldn't be using it at all. You wouldn't need it. Exactly. 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 All so, right. So, so you uh, you were in the water, and then uh-huh. you cha- and then you changed focus, and yeah. uh, you that was you, a little random. Yeah, well, <laughs> I never thought about working with elephants before. <laughs> Definitely marine mammal. Exactly. Uh, so you went from a wetsuit to dry land. Tell us, uh, tell us why, how, and why you haven't looked back. Um. Well, <laughs> <laughs> when I was working at SeaWorld. I worked at Dolphin Stadium, I worked at Sea Lion and Otter, did Shamu Fish House, so I got the full SeaWorld experience in about six months. Um, And in that time, I was really lucky. I I made friends with one of the senior trainers, uh, Kelly Lehman. She's she's left SeaWorld at this point, but she's been there over 20-something years, and she's one of those people that just constantly wants to help people learn and and train people. And... and, uh, She's just a fantastic lady, and while I was there, um, I worked quite a bit with her at, at Dolphin Stadium before moving over to Sea Lion. And uh, after my six months, basically at SeaWorld San Diego, what they do is they've got this apprenticeship. So you go there, you work for a year or two, and if depending on how many jobs become available at the end of the busy high season, depends on whether or not they can offer any additional jobs. Mm-hmm. Well, my year, we had a lot of second people that had been around the year before and um, so I wasn't offered a second job and mind you in order to get that job in the first place I did five swim tests at oh. SeaWorld all over the US yeah. and three within a month of each other and um, that particular swim test I was my pool for that job was 500 applicants so in order to get into this field, you have to be... You needed to have fins. Completely. And, you know, for well, that swim test, you needed to have gills and fins, for heaven's sakes. Pretty I know. Much. That's a pretty intense swim test. But you definitely had to be persistent. It's not something that was just going to come easy. And so um, at the end of that, I was just kind of hanging around. I was working as an aquarist again for a little, a little company that took care of personal tanks, things like that. And uh, Kelly calls me up and she said, hey, my husband manages the elephant program over at the San Diego Zoo Wild Animal Park, now the Safari Park. Um, do you want to train elephants instead? <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> why not? <laughs> so tell me more about this program. And she explained that they had all come over from Africa, the elephants, and that they were naive, um, only been there about a year and a half. And uh, Curtis and Curtis Lehman and Jeff Andrews had created a program that was all positive reinforcement training. So it was the same, because why I went to SeaWorld is I was interested in positive reinforcement training. And so um, when I got offered that job, I was over the moon because here I'm working with some of the best. Curtis Lehman is probably one of the best animal trainers out there. And I don't think Thad Lucinic, Otto, or um, Gray would say no to that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he is. They he probably wouldn't. Him. Thad might. No. But me, but no, me. <laughs> Thad, Thad would not. Curtis is one of those trainers that, you know, he puts the sparklers on and, and the animals, everyone else is just trying to keep up because he's just so much fun. I love it. Well, um, Yeah, so it's it was amazing. I worked with some of the best animal trainers and even though they were a lot of them were marine mammal we had some that had 20 some years of experience so working with elephants and so they worked in that previous history like johnny walco um but then johnny absolutely was a great trainer and um came over and you know for him he saw the benefits of what 
positive reinforcement training could do with the animals. And he's like, I don't understand why you do it any other way. And then you've got someone like Keith Pruitt's 20 something years of experience with marine mammals and um, just really great trainer. And then um, I kind of started and came up with Mindy Albright. Um, she's now the lead there. And it was just a great timing to go in. There's a lot to train and and an unbelievable cast of support to learn from. So it was phenomenal. Fantastic. Wow. You've worked with the programs in San Diego and in Tampa and with the great auto fad. The great auto fad. We love yeah. him. Uh, <laughs> love, love, love the auto fad. And you personally have taken elephant care and management programs that were failing here in the U.S. and turned them completely around. But last November, you started the latest chapter in your extraordinary life. Tell us about New Zealand and Myla. Mila. 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 An elephant by any other name. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Um, Mila is, New Zealand is amazing. It mm. is such an incredible country. If anyone has a chance to come and visit, and the New Zealanders would kill me for saying this, um, it is Too bad. Awesome <laughs> <laughs> too, too bad. Lord of, the, Lord of the Rings kind of beat you to the punch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. it's such a beautiful country, and the people here are wonderful. And Mila is a pretty lucky elephant. I mean, she is now in a scenario, you know, the woman that rescued Mila gave up literally everything to take care of that elephant, and no one else wanted her. No one else would take her. So when she was going to be retired from the circus, Basically, she came to Franklin Zoo because there were no other zoos in Australasia that would take her. Um, lots of reasons for that. But um, she, so when Helen got her, um, she had literally just come from the circus, like had to be unchained, let out of the circus trailer and into where she's been for the last uh, almost four years. And T tell me, how, ma how, how many years was she with the circus, traveling with the circus? Um, she's 40. She w came over here when she was three. She's oh. been here for four years. So 33 years. <laughs> 33 years and moving around in a very small little cart, being moved in a tiny little trailer and then being made to perform. And we're just really certain that it's not with positive reinforcement training. Oh, I'm absolutely certain. Okay. He actually wrote a book and in it talks about blow torching the hair off of her, which is very common mm. in circuses. What? Uh, back in the day. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, Andrew, you got to continue. I just need a moment. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Well, see, you're I used mean, you're used to things like that, Aaron. We we just that's that's a new one. It's not it's not something that the everyday person's ever going to know, and until it's put no. out there, and you have to say what it is, and, uh, and, that's, no. and that's the hard I'm, part. And and someone wrote a book and had it published and, and actually admitted to doing this to this elephant. Oh, yeah, because it's all traditional circus stuff. So for mm. someone like that, they don't realize that they think everybody else is just a bunch of animal rights ninnies and right. um, don't understand that, you know, that's how you take care of an elephant and, right. you know. I haven't cried on this show in a long time. Look no, what I'm you doing. haven't. Oh, wow. No, okay. All her. right. Yeah. Um, well, well, just so you know, yes. yeah. Mila is a very, well, she's come a long way. Helen did an amazing job. Great. And basically when she got here, what Helen wanted was for Mila to learn how to make decisions and learn to walk away. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the great moments was when she was doing foot care with Mila and Mila just put her foot down and walked away. And Helen was excited because that was the first time and it took like 11 months for that to happen. But that was the first time that Mila made the choice to walk away from a trainer. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Yes. She showed that, yeah, she had learned that she could do that. She had to, you know, water was always something that was provided to her at specific times. So it's not like she really had water at her um, leisure. Okay. It was always provided um, at various points along the way and with specific training methods in mind. Um, so when... Mila came to the Franklin Zoo, she had to learn to drink water when she wanted to. You know, it's, it's a totally different psychological um, change. Like, it's 
it's available. You can, if you are thirsty, you can have water. Um, and seeing that so, change has just been the moments that you've treasured with this animal. And and and, and Helen. Now tell us tell yeah. us a little bit about Helen. Yeah. Helen was one of those people that she's larger than life. Mm-hmm. Um, what she was accomplishing and what she was doing. Um, I don't know how there was enough time in her day to get everything done that she was doing. Um, she was one of those people that she ran a full zoo. Wow. She took care of all the animals. I have not talked to a single person in New Zealand that didn't come here and say, oh, yeah, we would talk to Helen for hours. Helen was the vet. She was the zoo director. She was the main animal keeper. How on earth did she have time to talk to these people for hours? But she always made time. And that's the thing. Her passion, her dedication, not just to the animals, but to the education of people, was so absolute. She ran herself ragged. She Mm. gave everything to everyone. She worked with um, what's called MPI here now. It was called MAF. It's kind of like USDA in the States. Mm -hmm. And creating nutrition pellets, creating... Um, regulations with them. She would do a lot of stuff for New Zealanders are very, very, very protective of their native species, which all happen to be birds. Um, They don't have any mammals as a native species. So one of their birds is called a kia. And um, they need to, they've got a lot of rats and stoats and things like that, that, that were brought in from obvious locations mostly Mm -hmm. England and and, uh, Europe Mm -hmm. but all these animals have taken over New Zealand and so they work really hard to protect their native species so they do a lot of uh, pest control and one of the things that she developed was an actual pellet that could be laid out that would take care of the pest issue but was non-toxic to Kia. Wow. And that's one of their birds that everyone, you know, and the Kia are basically like a parrot. They're, they're a pretty good sized bird and they are well known for, they're so strong. They can rip apart a car. And we, Um, we actually only know them as cars here. (laughs) We, that's all we've got here. Our Kias as cars. They can rip apart a car. Hmm. Wow. Well, like they'll go and they'll start with the windshield wipers and they'll start <laughs> canceling the hose and then they may go over to the window and start picking at like the <laughs> the sealant around the window and get that all up and then the next thing you know they're digging into the side and kind of pulling back the Wow. Yeah, they can do a lot of damage. So Helen is this is this wonder woman with regard to native species with regard to zoos. So so Helen learns that this 40-year-old elephant, who has had no socialization really with any other elephant, who has had a blowtorch taken to the hair on its its back, and has been made to perform tricks uh, without positive reinforcement training, is now retiring. And what's going to happen to this elephant? So Helen steps in. Now tell us, and she gets this elephant. Tell us why does Mila now need to come to the United States? Because that's that's where she's coming. She is. Um, basically, Helen looked for years. Even before she took her, she looked for all other options first. She looked, you know, worked with Mila's previous owner years before he even sold her to the circus that ended up retiring her, looking at a few possible locations for Mila and uh, in Australia. And um, they ended up pulling out. Must have been uh, her previous owner's sparkling personality. Um, and... So she looked for a lot of different options first, and then when she got Mila, it took a long time. She talked to some people around the world in Australasia. She brought a lot of people out here to try and help her with Mila, and it just wasn't working out. Um, Either she didn't have the money to keep them going, or uh, some of them tried using some of their traditional elephant training methods in a protected context situation. And Mila is, um, she was a one person elephant. She only worked for one person and that was intentional that she not work for anybody else. No one else was ever trained to work with her. So, um, she made those people back up pretty quick. Um, Mm. and 
basically Helen got a call and she was starting to get things organized and uh, she'd worked with the Ritz Circus, the circus that ended up retiring her. They'd only had her a couple of years um, and decided that that wasn't a scenario that they wanted to continue. They didn't care for the way she was being cared for. So they decided to retire her. And um, Aaron, I just want to stop you for one second because I'm not understanding. They didn't, this circus didn't like the way she was, they didn't care for the way she was being cared for. Weren't they the ones caring for her or did her previous owner, trainer, come with her to the circus? Yeah, he came with her to the circus. Oh, and so they so they didn't they didn't appreciate the blowtorch. I enjoy that. <laughs> yes, yeah. they didn't. Well, there's or a lot of the methods. Because, yes. Well, the other thing though is that um, they were getting protested at every turn, and what ended up happening, same thing that's happening in the U.S., is that as they're getting protested and they're no longer allowed to take Mila into the parklands into Got areas it. that they used to be able to let her out and just put up a tape around mm -hmm. uh, an electric mm -hmm. tape mm -hmm. and used to be able to let her roam around a little bit uh -huh. um and enjoy some of the parkland but because of the protests then the city councils over here stopped allowing them to have access so what ends up happening to mila she gets shot in a trailer for 20 some hours a day mm. now that that did happen because people protested and rather than solve the solution right. find a mm -hmm. solution which right. is give her a place to go right mm -hmm. they took away the option just to try and force um force her force the scenario into you know it's, we don't so, want her here so and the activists created a worse scenario for the elephant absolutely and, and it un happens a lot unlike here where we 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 don't deal we deal with ringling brothers we deal with vargas we deal with a lot of these major corporations and they actually own the elephants but in uh, so what what you're saying is that and this is an inf information that i didn't know in smaller circuses they will <clears throat> what lease the elephant they Ooh, will uh, right. but and and with the elephant comes the trainer slash oftentimes owner well, and actually, so it's a package deal he sold her to them, but then also she, part of it was that right. She wouldn't work for anyone else, so he had to he had to be hired as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Sneaky. Yeah. So, it, when you were looking for a facility for Mila, you were looking at zoos as opposed to sanctuaries. Can you tell us why? Actually, I looked at everything. You did. Okay. Um, yeah, we looked at the well. Australasia was not going to be possible. Um, there isn't a facility over here. A, there's only one African elephant other than Mila in Australasia. She's at the uh, Western Plains Zoo in Dubbo, and um, they didn't want Mila. Once um, Cuddles, I think it is, passes, then that's it. They're they're staying with their Asian elephants. So, um, and so anyway, so once Mila it was decided Australasia is out. There is nowhere for her to be. There is no, there is one other elephant in New Zealand, and that's Burma. She's at the Auckland Zoo. They are working on a situation for Burma. They are working to find other Asian elephants for her to be with, um, whether that be at the Auckland Zoo with other Asian elephants that are brought in or at an Australasia Zoo with other Asian elephants. They're, they're sorting that out and working towards that. Um, Mila's not a good fit to go be with Burma because African, Asian, and also they're looking at potentially having a breeding program um, over there. So African elephants bring a strain of herpes virus potentially that is deadly in Asian elephant calves. Wow. So it's much better that she come in and integrate with an established um, herd that isn't interested in breeding. So it doesn't matter when she comes over if it's Africans, Asians. Got it. You know, ideally it's Africans. Mm -hmm. Ideally, mm -hmm. sure. she gets to be with her because African and Asians are totally different. How they handle scenarios, how they, everything about them. They're only 96% alike genetically. Humans oh. and bonobo chimps are 98. Wow. We are more closely related to bonobo chimps than elephants, <laughs> Asian elephants, African elephants. Related to African elephants. Uh, That's fascinating. Uh, and yeah, it's. It's crazy. So everything down from their toes, they have different number set of toenails, I guess you should say. They have the same number of toe digits underneath. But 
but um, the toenails, Asian elephants have one more toenail on each foot than African elephants to their general personality and how they handle things. Asian elephants, if they're being um, a dominant elephant, they may just move the other elephant around the habitat by walking closer to them and forcing the other elephant to move. African elephants, I've watched an African elephant displacing another one and break her tusk on the rump of the other African elephant. So they're very different wow. on how they handle things. <laughs> Aaron, we are going to take, a, I'm just shocked, we are going to take a bit of a short break and we are going to come back with more of your tale on Mila the Elephant because it's just fascinating. So stay with us. Listeners, stay with us. We will be right back. And now once again, it's time for Maureen Flanagan and the Vegan Teas, a fabulous recipe today, even though I can't pronounce it. Agadashi tofu. Hey. Thank you very much. Vegan agadashi tofu. Stop it. Tell me what's going on. This is one of my favorite dishes to get at a Japanese restaurant. However, most are not vegan. It is made with bonito flakes, which are bonito fish, fish flakes. Therefore not vegan. Therefore not vegan. Um, so I have veganized it. I love it. It's like vulcanized or caramelized <laughs> and you it's, veganized. It's very simple. And in the Japanese culture, they have a broth. They call it dashi, which is aga dashi, mm -hmm. the dashi part. And to make uh, a vegan dashi, you do shiitake mushrooms and dried kombu, which is a Japanese seaweed. You can get it whole paycheck. You can get it um, at health food stores. I don't think you can get it at, let's say, a Kroger or a... Target or, or Target like or Target, no, no, no. Um, but it's or you can get it online and anything online, and uh, it's worth worth its weight in gold because it adds umami. Ah, oh, that's where the word umami. That's a that's your sixth flavor. Really, I guess there's sweet, sour, savory, S salt, uh, bitter. Oh, like a savory would be salt, and there's a fifth one. I, didn't I even think see it's umami. I didn't even know that there was it's a fifth, fifth or it's sixth. Really? Yeah. That's what it is. You know, I, you know what I was about to do? Ask you if, 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 if you've ever had an umami burger, but then I realized, no, you're a vegan. I have had an umami burger oh. before I was vegan. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Did you, did you get that fifth, fifth taste? No. Okay. Well, anyway, you will get it here, listeners. But this, um. <laughs> but this is amazing. You deep fry, and I'm all for deep frying. Anything there is no fry. lack of flavor in these Wonderful. dishes people I just you need to know that I, I fry I add sugar and fat it's so good make agadashi tofu vegan style I'm gonna go do that all right you can find this recipe www.ubnradio.com the animal magnetism page check under recipes it will be there you should be there go get some and we are back listeners with the wonder woman also known as Erin Ivory um so much accomplished in her comparatively young life. Just, I am in awe. One of my personal heroes you've become, Erin. Um, we are talking about Mila, and we are the show is devoted today to a very, very specific and special elephant, 40 years old, traveling around New Zealand in a little circus with, um, with one particular owner slash handler, and this handler was, I'll just say it, cruel to her for... 43 years of her life. She came to New Zealand when she was three. Entered. Uh, 30, 33. 33. Yeah. She came to New Zealand. Oh. I'm sorry, when she was 33, but the handler had been, had been, had been handling her for long before that. Um, she has. No. She, no? Sorry. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. We haven't, we have, <laughs> we've got, we've got some wrong information written down. No, she's 40. She's 40, and yes. She came, she was with, um, the other owner for 33 years. Ah, I understand. Okay. Okay. Uh, but l let us just suffice to say it wasn't good. <laughs> we'll just we'll just say it, that Mila's life has been a difficult one. Now she was rescued by another Wonder Woman named Helen in New Zealand, and Helen has and you and Helen have basically been trying to find a home for Mila for the past n a, a, a goodly number of months. Um, um, yeah, and actually, Helen, the reason I'm here is because Helen has passed. Uh, um, again, Helen, did not know. <laughs> this gets more interesting. So earlier when I was talking about um, Mila and 
coming here and learning to make her own choices mm -hmm. and, and everything. And, and Helen and how basically she was running herself ragged. They didn't have any support for this elephant. Uh, she basically came here and um, Helen had to erect a, a facility for Mila overnight. Basically she had, I think three days to put together the paddock and, wow. and put up all the, the areas for Mila to be. Mm. And, um, in it, and it's very typical in elephant facilities that hot wire will be one of the containment components. Mm -hmm. And so on Anzac day, which is a huge national holiday over here, it celebrates, um, the Australia, New Zealand, um, forces that were part of, um, the world war, I think it's world war two. Mm -hmm. And, um, so anyways, they, they have this big celebration. And so the zoo was open and Mila had clipped her trunk on the hot wire mm -hmm. and Helen stepped into her enclosure to calm her down and to, um, toss her some food. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Mila was very African elephant head up in the air, then, you know, and um, when Helen went to leave, she slipped and fell and she had a bad back. And so she didn't get up right away. And Mila walked over and picked her up. And Helen said, Mila, put me down. And Mila put her down. And um, the result was that the coroner report said that basically she had internal damages. So it was probably when Mila picked her up and then she said, Mila put me down at no point did people, most of the witnesses said that it looked like a circus trick gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, that Mila was just following what could have been a previous command. I don't know. It's so hard to tell because I wasn't there and right. no one that works here was actually visually there. It was just mm -hmm. a few guests. Um, but what I do know is that usually elephant aggression, when people say, oh, it was elephant aggression, it's hard to mistake that for a circus trick. Exactly. Um, usually when an elephant is going after someone or, or with that intent to kill, um, there's no mistaking it. Mm -hmm. It looks exactly the way it is. Right. So whether or not Mila was just tense, but nothing about the scenario to her walking over and picking her up from what it sounds like or to what happened after as Helen was laying there, Mila stood next to her and just ran her trunk up and down her body. That's not so, an aggressive animal. That's not an animal that, that wants to kill that someone. No, that doesn't sound no. like the scenario that has been around other incidences of aggression towards trainers. So even though I wasn't there, I wasn't able to see what Mila did. I can only go based on what was given in the reports. But what I do know is that that 30, that couple of minutes doesn't take away from Mila and Helen's relationship. It doesn't take no, away no. from what Helen gave up and what she was doing to help not just Mila, but all animals here in New Zealand and it certainly doesn't detract from her as a person every single person that works with animals knows when you work with wild animals you do assume a, you, a risk. you pays your money you takes your chances and I got to tell you something I think Definitely. the first person who would agree with you rest in peace is Helen mm -hmm. I think I, and, and and let's face it she died doing what she get which that which gave her bliss so tell us, tell us about Mila's personality a little bit more. What's, what's she like today? Uh, she's funny. She's a <laughs> bit of a brat. Oh. Um, here at the Franklin Zoo, we joke, we have, um, um, and actually we just, we've rehomed over 400 animals. Jenny Chung has done, Jenny Chung is uh, Helen's sister and was here helping Helen um, for years prior to Helen's passing and then has taken over basically rehoming all these animals because they can't afford to have the animals and have it open. They can't replace Helen. She had too many roles and it would require too much money to be able to replace one person. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they, they made the decision to rehome all the animals. And, um, in that we had this 
pigtailed macaque named Carol. She's gone to Hoo-Ha, helping you help animals, the sanctuary in Wellington. And Carol, we used to talk about, was the queen because Carol would come over and she would basically decide if she liked you or not. And then (laughs) once that decision was made, she would completely control how much time she spent with you, what you were able to do with her. I mean, she would come and sit with you and it was as if the queen just joined you for tea. Um, (laughs) She would just, everything was about her and um, she would look at you if she wanted to, but it was all this whole persona of, um, I am gracing you with my presence. Mm. And then um, we have a little cat, Kiara, who's a little princess and runs around. And Kiara is actually going to be coming back to the state. She's also becoming an American. Um, she's coming with me. And um, and then we have Mila. And we always talk about Mila being a little princess because um, she tends to want, you know, if she wants attention or if she wants something, she'll like throw hay or something like that to try and get attention (laughs) or she'll hit things like, come on, come on, you know? So, um, but overall she's extremely smart elephant. Mm. She's picking up on all these behaviors very quickly. And, um, she's a very willing elephant, but she is pretty reactive. Um, African elephants are generally more reactive than Asians, but with Mila's background, it's one of those things where she would be, you know, you would be working something brand new and she wouldn't know what you would be doing. So she would react and she would hit the bollards to kind of like get you to, to back off because she didn't know what you were doing. Right. So through the training and one of the things that I've always learned in my lifetime is that when an animal gets aggressive, you ignore it. That's an undesired behavior. Mm-hmm. And by ignoring it, what you do is you a say that's not going to get me to walk away um and you work them through it and show them that whatever you're doing isn't going to be scary it's not going to be something that's going to hurt them and once she understood that and would get through that process then it's no big deal and she's very calm and relaxed and leans in and also it shows them that you are not afraid of them this aggressive behavior which is which which is an incredible deterrent well, and a lot of people in the training world think that if you that walking away um, is the best option because then then they get nothing, they get no attention, they get nothing from you. But that's assuming that your presence is more reinforcing there than it is gone, and that's a pretty um, arrogant thought. When the reality is. Maybe they would just rather you were not there. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? So Exactly. I've had a couple of boyfriends like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's one of those things where, you know, you teach them if they want to end their session, they simply get aggressive and you walk away, you know, by assuming that you're always more reinforcing than you walking away. Um, that That's kind of a an arrogant thing to think. Um, and by just ignoring it and working them through it, then they learn, okay, whatever you're doing wasn't going to be scary. It's, it's going to be fine. Right. And then you see their aggression decrease and almost go away completely. I mean, this elephant is now working with four trainers. First time in her life she's had four trainers. I've worked with three of the young men here, um, phenomenal workers, and now she – works with them she'll do all the behaviors with them she's learning new behaviors with them so and all of that is to help her in her transition Mm -hmm. and um she's doing fantastic she is an awesome elephant she's pretty funny too i think all elephants are awesome they pretty are yeah before we take our our next break um real quick erin let's talk about the zoo versus sanctuary debate what are the misconceptions and what do the people on the street need to know Well, a lot of people think um, that the sanctuaries are this utopia for um, elephants or animals in general. And it's one of those things where, yeah, they've got some great aspects to the sanctuary. I don't think you will talk to a single person that works with elephants that doesn't want a couple hundred acres for their elephants. I would love to have an elephant facility with thousands of acres Mm -hmm. um, to be able to work with. But the difference to me of, 
you know, a sanctuary is the animals that go there, um, they're basically going there and some sanctuaries are able to provide better health care than others. Mm -hmm. Um, but typically your zoos have a stronger husbandry regime and, and can do a lot of the health care things, um, that need to be done for the animals. Right. Um, whereas sometimes at the sanctuaries, they just don't have the same expertise. Okay. There and or, I know that they're or, or working staffing, on it. Or staffing. I mean, the veterinary staffing. staff sometimes is is you know on call there, but they're not. Exactly. But they're not there. Yeah. Exactly. And then the other um, aspect is you know people have this thing about space. They think that space is the most important thing in an animal's life. Space is not the most important thing. It's how you manage the animals. And if you put all their food in one spot outside the barn, guess where the animals are going to hang out? The one spot outside the barn. If the animals come in at night and are in the barn during the night, they're not out roaming those acres. So it's one of those things where you have to understand that everything has pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do I wish that, um, the elephants that I work with had tons of space. I would love it because of the way that we could use that sure. space, but it is how you use it. You know, Bush Gardens does not have a massive habitat, mm -mm. but I would stack that enrichment program oh. up against any program in the <clears throat> world. I, I am I am trying those. to get that enrichment program to Los Angeles. I have... I have spoken with the zoo director. I have laid it out. I, he's, you know, I think he's been in contact with AutoFed, and uh, and we are desperately trying to get that co uh, and I, a duplicate copy, an identical copy of that enrichment program it's for our elephants of Asia because there's nothing else like it, and it's a win, win, win for the elephants, the zoo, and the patrons. It's absolutely. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the one yeah. thing that Otto and the Bush Gardens team is amazing about is it's not just you go out there and, and you set a few things. It's a challenge oh. to become yes. unique and yes. do something different. And not only that, but it's an opportunity to show guests and talk to guests. I mean, I don't think there's a facility out there that spends as much time with the elephants and the guests as Bush Gardens. It's Campbell just Day. amazing. It's and it's amazing to watch. You know, we're speaking specifically of elephants, to, uh, elephants today, uh, Mila in particular, but Let's talk about a very general question because we, we talked about activists today on the show and how they can do more harm than good, how they forced um, Mila to have to stay in her trailer for 20 hours when she, optimally she could have gone out walking had they, not be, had they not been protesting. Let's talk about the difference between animal welfare and animal rights. Right. Um, there is a pretty big difference. I mean... And if you want to make change in the world, um, going to South and Southeast Asia and talking to them about animal rights isn't going to get you far no. because they'll simply look at you and go, we as people don't have rights here. So mm. why would our animals? Exactly. Um, exactly. So animal welfare is about looking at the animals care, how they're managed and optimum welfare for their species. It's not about giving them rights. Rights to what? Right. I mean, we're there is no wild anymore. So people need to stop thinking that these elephants are going to go live in utopia in the wild. The wild right now is killing elephants at a rate of an elephant every 15 minutes That's for right. African elephants. That's right. Every 15 minutes. That is not this utopia of freedom, you know, in South and Southeast Asia, you have elephants stepping on forgotten landmines. You mm -hmm. have them um, getting hit by high-speed trains. You have them being poisoned by people just trying to, to live. So it's a, it's a pretty rough life out there mm -hmm. um, in the elephant world right now, um, basically due to the human-elephant conflict. And I think that when people are so focused on the rights that they forget about the welfare, you know, as much as you want to change what the animal's doing, you have to go in and you have to have a solution. And I think that's the difference between animal rights and animal welfare. Animal welfare organizations like SeaWorld is out there constantly saving animals and putting them back out into the wild, um, doing rehab. You have Wildlife Alliance in Cambodia, who is oh. the complete package. Yes. You have yes. 
you have people that are welfare oriented and they are looking at a solution. Animal rights is political. Animal mm. welfare is solution based and gets stuff done. Brilliantly, brilliant, brilliant, brilliantly put. So, my dear, um, something has just happened on the show that has never happened before. We have an entire uh, other half of an interview to do with you because you were so well spoken, so eloquent, so expansive on your answers to the first half that we have. <laughs> well, I have so many more questions for you. So, I'm going to ask, okay. I'm going to ask if this can be part one. And Absolutely. we are going, yes, we're going to ask you to get up again at six <laughs> o'clock in the morning, New Zealand time. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be coming back at you very, very soon, like within maybe the next month or so, because there are big doings, big happenings. I want to talk about this in this enclosure that you want to build, and it's so exciting, but we don't have time for it today. Um, so tell me, yes, you will come back. Absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll we're gonna we're gonna schedule that pretty much, um, you know, when we when we get off the line with you. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I, your management philosophy mm, so brilliantly sums up one of the main points of this show and why this show exists. And hopefully this show will be as expansive as, as you are in your, in your eloquence. And that is to utilize pro progressive, positive behavior management techniques to develop trust-based relationships that create an environment where the animals willingly participate in their own care. It's, I, I, it, is, it will forever be a mystery to me why everyone on the planet doesn't see that, even those who, are, who do live in, in, in poverty-stricken situations. It's just a win-win for everybody. Tell, uh, Aaron, before we sign off, tell, tell my listeners how they can help you. I'm sorry. What? Tell tell my, tell my <laughs> listeners how they can help you. What can they do? Where can they go? We're going to have your uh, Facebook uh, posted. We're going to have your Twitter posted. But what can my how what how can my listeners help you? Um, basically, I just want to. I, I would like them to kind of keep their eyes and ears open. You know, I've got something coming in the works, hopefully in the near future, mm -hmm. and um, I want them to think about animal welfare and how they can help in their day to day. Support organizations that are welfare-based. You've got so many options out there. Find the ones. Instead of looking for animal rights, look for animal welfare. Toss you out a few. Give us some names. Give us some uh, names. Wildlife real. Alliance yep. is phenomenal in Cambodia. You've got LEC, um, the Elephant Nature Park. Yep. You have um, Daphne Sheldrick is working with a lot of people in Africa. The Sheldrick Trust, um, yes. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um Support support organizations like the San Diego Zoo, Bush Gardens. Support the organizations and speak out for positive reinforcement training and look to see what kind of training your facility does. If they have an ANCUS, even if it's protected contact, even if they tell you it's a, it's only there just like a target pole, yeah. it does mm, not mean the not. same thing as target mm. pole. Mm. It does not. They are two totally separate things. They mean separate things. Um, Fantastic. Aaron, my listeners, um, and, I've, and I only have the best listeners, um, I know that they will take your words to heart, and I know that they will do exactly what you say. So we're going to talk to you again in a, mm, about a month. And we're going to uh, we're going to finish up, and and then we're going to talk to you again after that, of course. But uh, I have so many more questions that we just didn't get to today. Thank you, my dear. Go back to sleep. Um, uh, all all the best. All of our love from the states here to you and to Mila, and um, just keep on keep on doing. We just we appreciate everything you do, my dear. So we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Thank you, guys. It Thank was you. wonderful you. being with you this yeah. morning. Well, get used to it. You're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a great day. You too, my dear. Okay, now it is time. What an amazing interview. <laughs> oh, I just I just get goosebumps. I get chills. It, uh, but it is time for the trivia question for today. How often does a young adult female gorilla give birth? How often? And anyone in the chat room who answers this question, the first one to, actually the first one to answer, not anyone, the first one mm -hmm. to answer the question, not only gets a fabulous Kong treat from our amazing sponsor, Kong Pet Toys and Pet Treats, the only ones I use for my animals, but they will get a copy of Gray Stafford's book, Zoomility, 
And a jar of Coragem ointment for your animal um, skin ointment or for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yay! Uh, now it's time for Do- Dr. Gray's pet tip. Here we go. Once again, it is time for one of my fave, personal fave rave in segments of the show. It's time for Dr. Gray Stafford's pet tips. So here we are with pet tips for the 21st century, very evolved pet owner and lover. Welcome again, Dr. Gray. What do you got for us? Well, I have a confession to make. Uh Uh, Uh-oh. Years ago, I was not a fan of crating animals, especially dogs and cats. I thought it was confining. I thought it was kind of mean and limiting. And uh, I've had an epiphany over the last 10 years or so. Training your animal and teaching them how to do it properly is an amazing resource for pet owners because it gives you flexibility on on what to do with your pet in new situations and and even common ones like going to work. So here's how you do it. You want to make sure going in a crate is always fun. So what I like to do is I'll give my dog, for example, a, a, a favorite treat. I use boiled beef liver. And I reinforce them and give it to them at the back of the crate, the little side windows. And I always reinforce at the back of the crate. And this is because I want the animal to always want to go all the way into the crate and not play any games or hesitate at the threshold of the, of the, of the crate. Right. So I encourage people to not reinforce or even pay attention to their pet through that magical door once it's closed because that's where the problem begins. That's where you sometimes see a dog that's getting a little bored or anxious and they start falling at the door and they, they whine and they, I want to get out. Well, we want to avoid paying attention to them for that kind of anxious behavior, and we also want to remind them that it's okay, we're going to reinforce you way in the back of the crate. Now, let's say you've had them in the crate for a few minutes, and you want to let them back out. Okay. Give them a, tr- give them a treat at the back of the crate, and then let them out of the crate and ignore them for the next several minutes. We want to make sure we shift all the fun, all the reinforcement, all the praise, all the treats for going into the crate, and never for coming out of the, ca- out of the crate, because... The emphasis always has to be for going in, not for coming out. The reward of, of coming out of the crate is just being out of the crate. Sure. And if you do this over time and always reinforce them with a favorite food treat before you let them out, no, no matter how long it's been, they'll always want to go back in that crate the next time. Now, let me ask you a question. Is is crating for any any age dog? I know it's really kind of one, one of the more specific uses is that it's for puppies and potty training. Um, but is there, is there a length of time? Can that puppy, when it matures into a full-grown dog, still use the crate, or, or do, you, do you recommend stopping the crate after a certain point, or can it be just like the little, the little nest, the little den for the dog's life? That's, that's a great question. I actually trained my dogs to crate their entire lives. Uh, our German Shepherd, her threshold for crating was up to 10 hours, and we didn't wow. do that every day and every time, but that shows you just how reliable she could be if necessary. Uh, it was a, f- a fun place to be. And the reason I know it was fun for her is I would reinforce her in the back before I would let her out. I'd let her out, and she would come out, say hello to me, and go straight back in the crate, <laughs> even though she's been in the crate for a few hours. So that's how you know that the behavior is fun for them. It's the place they want to be. The other secret, Carolyn, is in, at times when I don't need to crate the dog, I actually close the door and deny them access to their little den as a way of keeping the anticipation, keeping the value for being inside that crate. You know, it's like a a favorite toy. If you have access to it all the time, it loses some of its value. So by closing the door strategically throughout the day and evening, when I don't need them to be in there, it helps maintain that value of going inside in the first place. Fascinating. I'm going to, this is, this is a great, a great tip for me personally, because I'm in the middle of crate training. And uh, listen, Sluggo may have two new homes now, uh, the backyard and, and the crate. So uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. We are going to talk at you next time. All right, it is time. It is time now for the last segment of the show, the hero of the show. Today's hero is Joyel E., unknown last name. We just know that it begins with an E. Joyel has started a petition on change.org aimed at the operators of Craigslist. Hold on to your hats, listeners. This, is gonna, this one's going to be hard, but you know what you know what to do. Jim Buckmaster, Craigslist CEO. Susan McTavish, Susan McTavish Best, Craigslist Public Relations Department. Quote, on August 31st, 2013, a young small female dog named Puppy Doe mm. was found brutally tortured in a Quincy, Massachusetts park. 
and we were all left wondering who could let this happen to any animal. The dog's injuries were so violent and severe that the only humane thing to do was to euthanize her. She had been starved, burned, stabbed, and limbs fu- pulled from her joints in what's been described as a medieval-style torture. It was later determined that the original owner of the dog had to give her up for undetermined reasons. According to media reports, the owner decided to put the dog, named Kia, up for adoption on Craigslist. Craigslist is often a go-to source for animal abusers looking for victims because it is anonymous and there is no accountability or screening process like regular shelters and rescue groups provide. I am asking, this is Joyelle speaking, but I'm asking it of you too, listeners. I am asking Craigslist to change their policies on these rehoming ads and only allow registered shelters and rescues to post adoptable pets so it is never again a part of tragedies like what happened to Puppy Doe. Please, listeners, go to the link that we provided on animal magnetism on the website or on the Facebook page, Carolyn Hennessy's Animal Magnetism, and sign this petition. Way to go, Joy L.E. Do this, listeners. Do it for Puppy Doe. And with that, we come to the end of another installment of Animal Magnetism. Thank you so much to my guest today, Erin Ivory, Wonder Woman. And thank you to my wonderful co-host, Miss Andrea Compton, who also pulls double duty as my producer. Thank you as well. To all the folks who makes this show possible, my other producer, Steve, uh, Steve Rohr, Dr. Grace Stafford of the Wildlife World Zoo in Phoenix, our contributing correspondent, Camille Lacotte, and vegan chef, Maureen Flanagan. Finally, to my board operator, Jamal, and thanks uh, to the handsomest man in broadcasting. And I'm so lucky because I get to look at him. The delightful Miss Tony Sweet. Keep, con- keep cultivating the preservationist heart, listeners. You know, you know that it's the way to go. It's the only path forward. Um... We'll, to- we'll, we'll talk at you again in two weeks. Stay, stay preserved, stay conserved, stay listening. Spread the word. Bye-bye. Something tells me it's all happening at the zoo.